<clears throat> Today we'll be looking at uh, Antonio Gramsci, the neo-Marxist theorist. Um, obviously, given this description, Gramsci's going to share a lot with Marx. Um, he's going to be within the same intellectual tradition. But he also diverges from him uh, in really important ways. Uh, because after all, you don't get called neo-anything for just making a few changes to a theory around the edges. Uh, you have to be obviously modifying something pretty significant, such that your view can be considered you know, a fully-fledged, independent, new theory, and Gramsci certainly does this. So first we'll look a little bit at uh, Gramsci's life, um, then we'll think about a number of key ideas uh, in his thought. Uh, we'll think about the concepts of hegemony, uh, organic intellectuals, counter-hegemony, uh, and the difference between a war of movement and a war of position. And I think this should give you a solid grounding in Gramsci's theories. Uh, and then in the second part of the class we'll consider how Robert W. Cox has applied Gramscian theory to develop an account of uh, international politics. Now, more than most of the theorists we've looked at previously uh, in this course, Gramsci's background clearly plays a huge role in the development of his thought. Um, he was born in Italy in 1891, uh, in the industrial heart of the country. Uh, he was born to an extremely poor family, uh, but he was able to secure a scholarship to study at the University of uh, Turin starting in 1911. Now, in the context of this, um, Gramsci started to frequent uh, socialist circles in, in Turin, and he joined the Italian Socialist Party in 1913. Um, however, after spending some time at the university learning about history and uh, philosophy, uh, he had to leave before completing his studies uh, in 1915 due to poor health. In 1919, he became involved with the socialist uh, journal Le Odin Nuovo, or The New Order, uh, and worked um, a bit like Marx did later in his life as a kind of journalist academic. And as a journalist uh, and an activist as well, he strongly supported the formation of workers' factory councils in the Turin industrial plants of, of Fiat and uh, Brevetti. And the reason for this is that he saw these councils as supporting the workers' self-determination. Um, ultimately, he thought, uh, these councils could serve as the, as the nuclei they could expand into or or form the template for a democratic socialist society. In 1921, uh, Gramsci helped to found the Communist Party in Italy uh, and became involved in the Communist uh, International. Uh, and around this time, uh, communist revolutions in Europe, of course, are uh, kicking off. Uh, we're one year away from the formation of the Soviet Union, and Gramsci is right in the heart of all of this. Now, of course, what occurred in Italy around this time was really the furthest thing from a communist revolution. Uh, instead of uh, communism, uh, Mussolini seized control of the country. Um, and in doing so, um, instead of being the first communist nation, uh, Italy ends up as the first fascist nation. Uh, so after Mussolini's fascist party came to power, they directly targeted the Italian Communist Party, and all of the top officials were hunted down and prosecuted for subversion, for conspiracy, um, in a range of other crimes um, against the state. Uh, so Gramsci then had to flee to Moscow, uh, where he worked in exile. Um, in 1924, however, Gramsci was elected to the Italian parliament, and this gave him the protection of parliamentary immunity, and so he was able to return to Italy and continue his work as the leader of the uh, Italian, or as a leader, sorry, uh, in the Italian Communist Party. However, despite his parliamentary immunity, Gramsci was eventually arrested by the fascists in 1926, and he was thrown in prison, um, where he eventually died. So he spent a decade in jail, and he died very young at the age of 46. So he spent almost a quarter of his life, in the end, um, in prison. While he was in jail, he wrote his uh, most important work, which was a series of notebooks that were later compiled as the prison notebooks. Um, and his prison notebooks were, were famously difficult. Um, they're not easy to read at all. Um, and there are two main reasons why this is the case. So first, of course, his life in prison was pretty horrible. Like he didn't get a comfy chair and a desk and you know, a library and so on, like most of the people that we're, we're looking at in this course. Um, so on top of his already existing health problems, and he had health problems his whole life, um, he was in fact he was a hunchback, um, uh, he had some pretty trying circumstances in, in prison. Um, so of course the prison notebooks are not going to be the most lucid um, 
uh, piece of work that you're going to encounter. But secondly, an important thing is he wasn't actually allowed to write about politics in prison. Um, so the prison censors, they'd read everything that he wrote um, to make sure he wasn't saying anything politically inflammatory. Um, but of course, the prison notebooks, you know, he's a, he's a neo-Marxist theorist, and the prison notebooks, they're, they're all about politics. Um, so he develops in these notebooks a new kind of historical materialism um, and a kind of political theory that is suitable, he thinks, for a democratizing kind of emancipatory, uh, emancipatory uh, project, right? This would never fly, um, it would never get past the, the, the fascist senses. Uh, so he had to write about politics, but at the same time, he had to seem to not write about politics. So he had to hide that he was writing about politics. So for this reason, he'd write about things at quite an abstract level, and he'd often write it in code. Um, and so his work there is quite cryptic and quite, quite challenging. But these are the basic ideas, um, and these are the ways that he diverges from classical uh, Marxism. So a classical view of ideology um, understands the superstructure as a site of domination, right? That's what we discussed with the base superstructure model um, on Tuesday. So politics, religion, culture, the media, all of these things, it's all shaped by the base in a way that dominates people. And it convinces people to have a false view of the world um, that supports the status quo. So in this way, we can, we can describe a classical account of uh, ideology um, as, as a subscribing to what we might call ideological epiphenomenalism, which sounds like a difficult word, um, it's really not. Um, the idea of ideological epiphenomenalism is that uh, the ideological superstructure uh, is merely determined mechanically from the economic base. Right? So it's this mechanical determination. Um, and that makes ideology or ideas, in a sense, kind of illusory, right? Uh, because ideology, ideas, end up playing no role whatsoever in politics, right? Because, you know, no amount of effort that you spend arguing for one position or another uh, can possibly change things. All of these ideas, they're an outcome. They're not a cause. They're not in the causal process. Um, so Marx said that the ruling ideas of each age have ever been the ideas of the ruling class. Um, but he, he subsumes this insight into... Um, his economic theory, right? The ideology will change as the underlying contradictions in the relations of uh, production play themselves out, right? It's these underlying relations for Marx that ultimately lead to revolutionary change. So it's not anything that happens in the superstructure. The superstructure, again, it's just this outcome. It's not, it's not part of the process of, of, uh, of change. So we can think of the superstructure for Marx, this classical view of ideology, as being basically irrelevant. It doesn't, doesn't do anything. It's just something we can observe. Uh, so we can think of the relationship between the base and the superstructure for Marx, or at least some interpretations of Marx, as being a one-way relationship. Go from the base to the superstructure, but not the other way around. Now, of course, uh, we've discussed already uh, on Tuesday the way that uh, the base um, or the way that ideology helps to reproduce the existing mode of production. Um, so in this, in this sense, perhaps we could think of the um, relationship between the base and the superstructure as being two-way. But because the content of ideology for Marx is determined exclusively by the relations and the forces of production, um, all it does is feed straight back into the base without really having any important role in understanding how societies change and, and why people do what they do. On the other hand, a hegemonic view of ideology uh, doesn't think that the relationship between the base and the superstructure is quite as one way as Marx wants to claim it is. So a Gramscian view of ideology uh, sees the superstructure not just as the site of domination, um, but rather as a site of struggle and a site of negotiation. So he sees the superstructure as being at least somewhat independent of the base. Now, he absolutely thinks, there's no question, he thinks the superstructure reproduces the base, uh, but the superstructure is not fully determined by the base. The superstructure, this realm of, of ideology, is in fact a place where ideas can be, 
uh, and where ideas are contested and fought over, and he thinks that's important. That's a real thing that, that contributes to the world. So we can think of things in this way. Right? There are two ways of wielding power. You can wield power through force, and you can wield power through consent. Now, Gramsci associates ruling through force with political society. Um, and he associates rule through consent with civil society. Um, so civil society is the sphere in which ideas and beliefs are shaped. Um, and it includes all of the institutions that we associate with civil society, such as the education, uh, education system and the media uh, and so on. So we're all right now part of the, the civil society. Now, importantly, these aren't two different ways in which society uh, could be governed. It's not force or consent, right? So we're not contrasting bad, you know, authoritarian societies who rule by force with, you know, nice, friendly, democratic societies like ours where, who uh, uh, people are ruled by uh, consent. Um, for Gramsci, a, a society, and including a capitalist society, has both of these spheres. It has both force and it has yeah, both force, force and consent, and they overlap with each other. <clears throat> but unless there's some kind of uh, crisis in our lives, the, the political sphere, the, the sphere of force, is always way in the background. It's not something we think about. It's not something we notice. Because, I mean, <laughs> who here feels like they do what they do in their daily lives because the threat of force? Does anyone feel that way? No, you don't, right? Um, it's consent, typically. We think uh, civil society that predominates, that, that <laughs> determines um, what we end up doing in our daily lives. <clears throat> in the civil society, then, different groups engage with each other um, in order to shape the nature of ideas and beliefs that underlie our society. So we aren't forced to believe anything in this public sphere. Um, we're not indoctrinated in the way that the uh, traditional model of ideology suggests. Um, rather, we fight over the ideas in the ideological superstructure. Right? And ultimately, through this contestation of ideas, a worldview is created. Um, and throughout this whole process, we can always say yes or no to various bits of it. So it's not all or nothing. But this kind of this provides us with a bit of a puzzle. Because on the one hand, we seem to consent to this ideological superstructure, right? We consent to the, the worldview, to the, to the civil society. Um, you know, when we agree, it doesn't seem like we're forced to agree. It's not the political um, society coming in and making us think a certain way or making us do a certain thing. But on the other hand, the ideological superstructure does seem pretty consistently to provide a worldview that supports, on the whole, uh, the interests of the dominant groups in society. So what's going on here? Like, that seems to be a bit of a puzzle. How can it be that we freely agree um, to something on the one hand, but on the other hand, what we freely agree to is basically always going to be a worldview that justifies the status quo um, and that naturalizes the interests of the ruling groups. Uh, and makes them seem to be the interests of all members of society, right? Why do we keep consenting to being dominated in this way? Well, for Gramsci, we have two basic classes in any society. We have the dominant and we have the subaltern. Um, though, of course, these classes themselves divided into uh, you know, other classes. It's not, it's not a completely straightforward picture. Hegemony... <coughs> is when the dominant class, the ruling class, has managed to persuade the other classes in society of their own moral, political, and cultural values. Um, so it convinces us that the worldview of the dominant class is the common sense, is just the way things are. Now, in the background, always throughout this, we do have the political sphere, right? We've got the state, um, and that controls us with the use of force uh, but this is not the main form of control in any society, and particular, particularly not in our society. Uh, right? It's not the main kind of hegemonic control that we actually find. 
Now, in part, I think the views of the, uh, of the dominant group seem more obvious and more natural because um, the dominant group already occupy a leadership position uh, by virtue of you know, the prestige that um, uh, these groups have historically uh, been given due to their position and their function and their importance in the world of production. But also, um, you know, this, this process comes about, this hegemony comes about through their control or their influence on the, uh, the major institutions in society. So who, you know, who controls what, who controls the media, who controls education, and so on. So for Gramsci, uh, it's the political society and the civil society together. Um, that's what we mean by the state, right? So for neorealists, the state is, is just limited to the government, right? Uh, it's those who make the decisions about international affairs. But for Gramsci, the state includes all of those things that work to support the ideological superstructure and the hegemonic uh, discourse, the hegemonic worldview, um, such as, as I said, the education system, the media, um, and politics as well. So that's all part of the same system. It's all in support of hegemony. <clears throat> But it's also the case that um, the hegemonic worldview is more than just a belief, right? It's also a lived experience for many people. Um, it's kind of a sense of a reality. It's a sense of the absolute. Um, and it's difficult for most people, most people to move beyond this, right? Because for one thing, the hegemonic worldview is a fairly comprehensive worldview. It offers a way of making sense of the world um, that's, we might say, complete. It gives us a complete answer to the way the world is. Um, but also, you know, it's just what you observe. It's just, you know, you can see that things are a certain way in society, and they seem natural. They seem that they should obviously be that way, because that's what you observe in the world around you. So why would you not trust what you observe? Now, the way that this uh, hegemonic worldview is constructed is by drawing on an existing reservoir of social meaning. So what Gramsci calls the common sense, or the popular common sense. Now, the popular common sense, it's nothing whatsoever like a, uh, like a comprehensive or complete or coherent belief system. Um, it's really just an accumulated assortment of various kinds of belief, um, including mythology and folklore, um, religion, popular culture, all of these other things that just form part of the backdrop of our society. The important thing with popular common sense, though, is that it's open to like, a myriad of interpretations. So by drawing on popular common sense um, to construct a hegemonic worldview, the dominant class is able to make the status quo seem completely natural, completely obvious. <clears throat> now, again, you know, once again, things are not quite so straightforward. Uh, for one thing, civil society, this realm of consent, where the hegemonic discourse is constructed um, and assented to, is, as I said, it's, n it's a place of contestation. Right? It's not a matter of the dominant group putting forward a worldview and all the other groups simply agreeing to it without question. So the dominant group, they need the consent of different groups in society, um, and different groups are going to contest the hegemonic worldview uh, in various different ways based on their own interests and their own way of looking at the world. So the dominant group needs to make concessions to these non-dominant groups if they're going to be able to construct this hegemonic worldview that everyone agrees to or that most people agree to. So the hegemonic worldview is not completely made up of the moral, political, and cultural values of the dominant group. It also contains bits from other social groups as well. Um, and this is not saying that the, the, the values of the dominant group are not the ruling values, but the, role, the ruling group, they don't get everything their way, according to Gramsci. Uh, they have to accommodate other groups in various different ways, uh, and sometimes in quite major, quite important ways. And one example of this is social democracy. Uh, so social democracy, the welfare state, uh, is, uh, or can be considered a compromise that the ruling group has made to subaltern groups in society. 
so in social democracy, it's seen as completely justified for the bourgeoisie to give the, the proletariat um, a higher uh, share of their surplus product. So that's a, an important change. Like the proletariat, they get more of what they're producing and, and significant amounts more. But what doesn't change in social democracy? Well, the relations of production in social democracy are still the same. It hasn't changed the relations of production. Um, so it's undoubtedly, there's no question, that social democracy is a form of capitalism in which the workers are better off, but it's still capitalism, right? So the ruling groups, they've made these really quite significant concessions to subaltern groups, to the proletariat in particular, in order to defend the hegemony of their more fundamental ideas and beliefs and values, these ideas of capitalism and these relations of production. So under, uh, uh, unlike a classical view of ideology, uh, according to Gramsci, there's this contestation between the various different social groups, or he calls them social groups because that's what he needs to say to get through the senses, but what he really means is classes. Um, and so he, you know, hegemony is, is this dynamic process. It's not just a passive thing uh, that once decided sits there and dominates society and dominates everyone. Um, it's this thing that has to be continually renewed. And this, pro this process of contestation is therefore this ongoing process. As hegemony is renewed, people contest hegemony and things change and so on. So it's continually recreating and modifying itself while at the same time being continually resisted and limited and altered and challenged. So how does this happen then? How do various social groups contest the, the current hegemony? Well, an important part of this is the idea of the organic intellectual. Uh, so for Gramsci, um, and I think this should be, um, or at least some variation of this, should already be a familiar idea for you. Um, all intellectual activity arises from a specific socio-economic circumstance, right? There's no such thing as disinterested intellectual activity. And this has been a constant theme through the, uh, the first part of this course. All intellectual activity stems from uh, a certain social position, and it's always political, it's always in the service of particular political ends. So Gramsci thinks that each group uh, have their own organic intellectuals. And they're the people who systematize and articulate the common sense of that group in particular. Right? They express that group's worldview, um, their moral values, their political values, and their cultural values. So for Gramsci, then, everyone is actually uh, a philosopher. Right? We all have this view of the world. Even if we don't systematize our view of the world, we all have a philosophical view of the world. And we all have ideas about how things are. Um, and the organic intellectuals are the ones who take the ideas that members of a certain social group usually have, and they systematize and promote them. And this is partly how contestation takes place inside a civil society. Organic intellectuals express the values, beliefs, and ideas of their group, and they try to convince members of another group or the other groups, that their ideas are the natural, the obvious, um, the incontestable ideas. So this man here, he is, uh, I'm sorry to say, an organic intellectual. Right? Every day on television, he articulates a certain vision of the world based on certain values. He puts these values forward right, as if they were obvious um, and as if they were natural. Now, given everything you know about this guy, and I'm sure you all know who he is, um, which social group do you think he is the organic intellectual of? Does anyone not know him? Uh, Paul Henry. So he's a, a, news, a news presenter. Yeah. So which, which social group is he an organic intellectual of? Yep. The media? I mm, wouldn't say the media is a social group. Yep. I would be very surprised if he did, but... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
pretty much the, the, the ruling groups, right? Pretty much the ruling groups. Um, so traditional intellectuals, though, um, are something different. So when you, you asked about the, whether or not he had a degree, that kind of speaks to the idea of traditional intellectuals. Um, and traditional intellectuals are the kind of people we usually, we usually associate with the term intellectual, right? Like university lecturers. Um, but, of course, Gramsci thinks that there's no such thing as a disinterested intellectual activity. So what role do traditional intellectuals play in society, uh, according to Gramsci? Um, well, you know, he thinks that traditional intellectuals are actually organic intellectuals for the ruling class. Um, so they're trying to put across the ruling ideas as if they were natural and universal and incontestable uh, and so on, right? They, I'm just telling you, look, this is what reason tells you is the case. So I'm putting myself across as, I'm, as if I'm this disinterested intellectual, but actually I'm working as an organic intellectual for the ruling class. I hope I'm not, but, but maybe I am, I don't know. But he thinks, generally speaking, people in my kind of position, that's what we do. Okay, so uh, uh, hegemony is always contested, right? The worldview of the ruling class, of the ruling groups, uh, it tends to dominate, but it always has to make, as I said, these concessions. And the subaltern groups, uh, the, uh, the non-dominant groups, they have their own organic intellectuals, right? And they're constantly resisting the hegemonic worldview uh, in various different ways. Uh, and they do this by offering these, these competing worldviews. So this process of contesting and resisting uh, the hegemonic discourse is what Gramsci calls counter-hegemony. So competing sets of beliefs and ideas and values, um, especially when they arise from a, a reasonably comprehensive worldview, um, are called counter-hegemonic discourses. So these counter-hegemonic counter discourses, um, they are also based, importantly, on the popular common sense but because the popular common sense is open to multiple meanings, open to multiple interpretations, uh, counter-hegemonic discourses draw on the common sense in order to put forward a competing uh, view, right? a competing interpretation of what this popular common sense means. So these counter-hegemonic uh, counter discourses, their aim is to, is to overturn the hegemonic discourses, right? They're trying to persuade the other groups in society uh, that their way of looking at the world is the right way, right? They're trying to form, uh, importantly, an alliance of different <coughs> social groups, um, and they're trying to get broad-based uh, broad agreement uh, that a particular counter-hegemonic discourse is the right way of looking at the world. Okay? So in other words, they're competing with the hegemonic discourse for the consent of the members of a society with a hope of overturning this hegemonic discourse and making the counter-hegemonic discourse the common sense of that society. If it can do this, right, if it can put together an alliance of social groups um, behind a comprehensive counter-hegemonic worldview, then it's created what Gramsci calls a historic block. So revolutions occur uh, when one historic block, uh, one comprehensive worldview, uh, is replaced by a competing counter-hegemonic historic block. <coughs> now this is um, a lot easier said than done, of course, um, because after all, the institutions of the state promote the hegemonic discourse. Um, so in order to, to develop a new uh, counter-hegemonic discourse, uh, or counter-hegemonic historic block, the sub uh, subaltern need to create their own institutions that can promote their own counter-hegemonic worldview. Um, so they need to build a counter-hegemonic state, right? Um, but they need to do this inside the hegemonic state, and that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, so they need to build a uh, yeah, their own state, their own institutions within a hegemonic system. That means they're always going to be at a disadvantage, right? Because the hegemonic system and its institutions are always trying to subvert the counter-hegemonic discourse. Uh, it's always trying to channel the energies, the criticisms, the, the uh, contestations of the counter-hegemonic discourse uh, 
um, into less problematic directions uh, by making these strategic concessions. And again, um, like social democracy is one of these strategic concessions. It says, you know, don't have your own institutions, don't oppose us, now that we can bring you inside. We'll make some changes so that we're all on the same page. So, for example, when the revolutionary potential of workers' councils um, are challenged and uh, channeled, sorry, into these social uh, democratic uh, institutions, um, this neuters their ability to uh, develop a counter-hegemonic historic bloc. Right? So this is one way that the hegemonic discourse uh, prevents counter-hegemonic uh, uh, historic blocks from arising and replacing them. Okay, this, uh, this process of this uh, counter-hegemonic uh, resistance is key to Gramsci's idea that the superstructure has a role to play that's independent of the base. Uh, so as I've mentioned already, Gramsci, like Marx, um, or at least like uh, maybe popular interpretations of Marx uh, at the time, um, uh, oh, sorry, Gramsci is not, unlike Marx, um, an ideological Epiphenomenalist. Uh, so for Marx, as I said, the superstructure uh, comes out of the base in this really deterministic manner, um, and it's just a one-way relationship. The superstructure doesn't really have an important role to play in uh, in this in this picture of Marx's. Uh, for Marx, revolution will come um, when the internal contradictions of a particular uh, mo uh, mode of production play themselves out in practice, right? Um, so in the case of capitalism, as we talked about on Tuesday, the internal logic of capitalism is going to have wealth accumulate in fewer and fewer hands, and this makes revolution inevitable for Marx. Right? But the important thing is ideas basically play no role in this. This is just something that happens all in the base, and that's all we need to think about. For Gramsci, though, ideas really matter. Ideas are really important. Um, in fact, Gramsci thinks that a physical revolution um, without a revolution of ideas is not feasible. It's not going to work. And the way he cashes this out is through this distinction between the war of movement and the war of position. Um, in these terms, they're obviously, obviously military metaphors, right? We can consider a, a war of movement as basically the actual fighting. Right? The battle starts, and the soldiers, and the tanks, and the planes, and so on, they engage with each other in battle. Now, war of position, by contrast, is what happens before the battle actually starts. Right? It's where you put your forces before you fight. So you set up where you're going to be, you move on to certain terrain um, with certain forces uh, in certain ways. Um, and this happens, as I said, it happens all before the fighting actually takes place. So this is basically a distinction between how you organize yourselves before the fight and the fight itself. And as any military strategist will tell you, um, the war of position is, in many ways, the more important war. Right? The actual fighting, that's all well and good, but to a large degree, the war of position is what determines um, in advance whether you're going to win the battle or not. If your forces are not deployed in the best way, um, if you haven't claimed the right terrain, for example, um, in the right way, you're going to lose the battle, um, even if your forces are physically stronger. Hmm? Okay, so with this metaphor in mind, if the proletariat were to uh, seize the means of production from the bourgeoisie, uh, which of the two kinds of war do you think that would be? Movement. Yeah, it's absolutely a war of movement, right? Um, and now, you can have successes in this war of movement, right? Um, workers can, can act. Uh, but if this terrain, if the war of position is against you, you're going to fail ultimately. Right? Any successes that you have in the short term are going to be rolled back due to the superior position that your enemies occupy. By contrast, which of the two kinds of war is counter-hegemony? Position, yeah. So obviously it's a war of position, right? 
And this is the war for Gramsci that actually matters. So this ideological battle, right? The battle in which you convince others of the obviousness, of the naturalness of your worldview, um, in which you make this counter-hegemonic alliance with other social groups, and you overturn the common sense of the status quo. Right? So that's where you ensure uh, your victory. Okay, yeah. So think about it like this. Right? If, you, if you win a war of movement, if you successfully mount a revolution, but most people in society still subscribe to the ideology of the dominant group, in the long run, what is going to happen? What's going to be the outcome of this? Absolutely, yeah, right, counter-revolution, right? You're going to have uh, uh, things going back to exactly the way things were before. On the other hand, if you win the war of position, right, if you convince other groups in society that your worldview is the right one um, and that the worldview of the dominant groups is the wrong worldview, then what is going to happen then? Anyone? You're basically going to have an inevitable victory. Maybe not now, but at some point in the future. It's going to be inevitable. right? And when it occurs, importantly, it's going to stick. Uh, because it's supported by this new... Sorry, yep. Yeah. They might, they might, but um, if you if you replace the um, hegemonic discourse with a counter-hegemonic discourse and build these new institutions and so on, you're at least going to be in that more secure position. So it may be that then you get the same thing happening again, um, but it's not going to be as inevitable. Like if you if you haven't changed people's minds, um, then there's nothing to change back, right? But if you've changed people's minds, then if people want another revolution, they have to change people's minds again, and that's kind of hard once you're entrenched. That, that's the idea. So in this way, we can see how important the superstructure is uh, for, for Gramsci. It's not just this irrelevant thing, um, and it's actually where the most important conflict takes place in society. Yep? So I think, I, I think war of position would be necessary for First, I mean, there are some accounts, I don't think Gramsci's accounts, but some accounts that take this, which have the idea of a vanguard. So you would win the war of movement. Um, like you'd seize the means of production, you'd seize the institutions of the state, and then you'd use that to, to change people's minds. I don't think Gramsci would, would subscribe to that himself, though. Yeah. So the idea here is that the base um, is affected by the superstructure as much as the superstructure is determined by the base. Right? These material conditions of society and the ideas of society are all bound together, and they're always influencing one another. And so you can't reduce one to the other. Marx reduces the superstructure to the base. Gramsci says you, can, you can't reduce the superstructure to the base, and neither can you reduce the base to the superstructure. They're, they're semi-independent of each other. <clears throat> so this is the basics of Gramscian theory, um, but as with you know, previous theorists we've looked at, we can't leave things just there. Um, we should be thinking about what insights uh, Gramsci gives us into international politics. Um, and really, you can't talk about international politics in the context of Gramsci without talking about uh, Robert W. Cox. So for Gramsci in international relations, he's pretty much like the guy uh, to look to. Now, Cox takes from Gramsci the insight that international politics follows fundamental social relations, right? So what I mean by this is if we want to understand um, international politics, we can't look first and foremost to states, right? We have to also observe social relations within states. And that's important because fundamental social relations, they occur predominantly within a state, right? Um, social conflicts usually take place inside a state, all right? And it's inside states where hegemonic uh, uh, or hegemonies of social classes uh, are built, right? So states for, for Cox, they're still important. Um, but 
if the changes to these fundamental social relations first occur within states, um, and changes to international politics, right, such as uh, changes in um, the military or the like, geopolitical um, balance, occur as a result of these fundamental social relations, um, yeah, then of course we need to look inside that state if we're to have any decent understanding of international politics and how it works and, and why things occur. Um, but we can't treat states as realists do, as these black boxes, right, in which um, uh, what happens within them is really just irrelevant to international affairs. It's exactly the opposite for, for Gramsci and for Cox. The fundamental social relations inside a state, the stuff that's happening inside the state, they drive world affairs. Right? It's really important. So how does this, how does this happen then? Um, well, Cox argues that uh, the states which are powerful are those which have undergone a profound social and economic uh, revolution and have most fully worked out the consequences of this revolution in the form of state and social relations. Uh, so Cox invites us here to think about US, British, and Soviet power as examples of, uh, of this, what he means by this quote, right? So a, a hegemonic order has fully uh, taken hold within these hegemonic states, um, and they've worked out internally, inside the state, the consequences of this order uh, in their state and their social relations, right? So these states then transmit their social relations to others uh, uh, in this world order in which they are the center. And I think we can you know, think of this uh, world order as being a hegemonic world order. Now, when we describe this world order as hegemonic, we have to be clear that we're meaning this um, in the Gramscian sense, because this term is used in different ways in IR. Right? The term hegemony and hegemonic um, yeah, are used, are used in, in, in realism as well. But in these contexts, what they mean by hegemonic is just the ability of one state to dominate another state in the international system. Um, so, you know, they would say, a realist would say, the United States is a hegemonic state um, in the sense that it dominates less powerful states. In the Gramscian sense of this term, we have to pay attention to both the coercive as well as the as well as the consensual forms that power takes, right? So the, the realist view, you just care about the domination. The Gramscian view, no, the con the consensual forms of power are just as important. Um, and so Gramsci would think, and Cox would think, that this traditional use of the term is, is far too restrictive. <clears throat> now Cox argues that we can divide world history into what he calls hegemonic and non-hegemonic periods. Um, now, simply, obviously, a hegemonic period is a period in which a world hegemony has been established, um, and a non-hegemonic period, by contrast, is one in which um, dominance of a non-hegemonic kind, so dominance by force, predominates. Um, so we would say the height of the British Empire, for example, from uh, 1845 to uh, 1875, was a, a hegemonic world order, because the, the fundamental social relations of Britain had undergone a revolution, right? they'd undergone the Industrial Revolution, uh, and Britain had worked out the consequences of this revolution fully in their internal economic and social relations. And as a consequence, Britain was able to develop um, a set of economic doctrines that embodied its internal state and social relations, um, that expressed its interests, um, and that were able to maintain British uh, supremacy. Um, and it promoted these doctrines with considerable success internationally. Um, and of course, they weren't presented as ideas that were in Britain's self-interest, right? Um, it wasn't a matter of saying, look, you, know, you need to open yourselves up to trade because it's good for us. Uh, instead, they were expressed as these universal ideas that were derived from reason alone, right? They were presented as natural and as obvious and as commonsensical. Um, so we can think about ideas like comparative advantage, for example, um, free trade, the idea of the gold standard. Now, these weren't presented as ideas like, you should adopt these ideas because they'll be good for us. They were presented as just things that were obvious and you know, natural and facts about the world. Now, there's certainly, there's no question in the case of, of Britain 
um, that this hegemony was ultimately underwritten with coercive power, right? Because if you didn't get with the program, if you didn't adopt this hegemonic worldview, um, if you tried to challenge it in any way, then British armed forces would come along and they'd enforce obedience to it. Um, but the important thing is it didn't need to do this all of the time. It only needed to do it sometimes. Um, and really, as the hegemonic worldview of Britain spread further and further, it could really be maintained with only a minimum of violence, only on the edges, right? Because other nations were persuaded, um, they consented, right, to this hegemonic discourse that Britain was promoting. Now, Cox would also say that the current American world order is also hegemonic, right? It's based on the full working out of the fundamental social relations of uh, late or advanced stage capitalism. Uh, so the hegemonic worldview based on these internal social relations uh, contains ideas such as consumerism, um, the absolute importance of private property and competition. Uh, and these have spread outwards from the United States and really have become the common sense in much of the world. Uh, although arguably now this common sense is starting to be, starting to be challenged and perhaps we're we're heading towards a non-hegemonic world order. <clears throat> the key idea, though, is that uh, in order to become hegemonic, as I've mentioned, a state can't be seen to be working just in its own interests, right? So an order in which a state nakedly exploits another state is not a hegemonic order. The hegemonic state has to found and protect a world order that's universal in conception. Right? It, has to be an, it has to be an order <clears throat> uh, which all, or at least most, states can be convinced is compatible with their own interests. Um, and Cox points out that this order can't be conceived of in interstate terms alone. Right? If it were, if the hegemonic worldview was all about states uh, versus states, then it would foreground the sort of the oppositions between states, the conflicts of interest between states. Um, but a, a hegemonic worldview, it needs to make this worldview, this way of approaching things, this way of thinking about things, seem to be in everyone's interests. Uh, and a worldview based on interstate conflict, a realist worldview, um, obviously couldn't, couldn't be in everyone's interests. There's always a winner and there's always a loser, according to realism. Furthermore, a hegemonic worldview um, creates a globally conceived civil society. So in other words, it's a mode of production with global extent that links social classes within the countries that are enco encompassed in this, uh, in this uh, global civil society. And it's no coincidence, right, that the height of the British Empire was also a height of globalization. Um, and the height of hegemonic power of uh, the United States is also the height of a newer form of globalization based, based in these social relations of, of late stage capitalism. We're almost out of time, are we? No, we've got time, good. Finally, finally, as civil society um, within the state has institutions that support the hegemonic order in, inside that state, um, so are there international institutions that support the hegemonic world order, right? So for Cox, international organizations um, are one important mechanism by which the universal norms of a world hegemonic order are expressed and reproduced. So we can think of the World Bank, for example, um, or the World Trade Organization, or the International Monetary Fund as good examples of uh, this kind of organization. Now these organizations typically have the following characteristics. Right? First, they themselves are based in the norms, the ideas, the values of the hegemonic world order. Second, they're directly created by the hegemonic world order, right? I mean, it's no coincidence that the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are both headquartered in Washington, DC. Um, and the World Trade Organization is, is based in Switzerland, which is a country that's deep in the, in the hegemonic world order. Um, thirdly, they ideologically legitimate the norms of the world order, right? So they present the norms of uh, the world order as obvious, as natural, as beyond reasonable dispute. Fourthly, uh, they co-opt the elites from countries peripheral to the hegemonic world order, 
right? And they thereby help to bring those states more deeply into that order. Finally, they absorb the counter-hegemonic ideas. So, right, the idea with a, a hegemonic order is that it never completely dominates. There are always counter-hegemonies. Um, now, Cox thinks that these counter-hegemonies are most likely to arise from the develop, uh, developing world. Sorry. Um, but international organizations that support this hegemonic world order uh, make strategic concessions to neuter these counter-hegemonies. Right? They maintain the basic fundamental norms of the, he of the hegemony um, while bending on more peripheral uh, issues in order to bring these counter-hegemonies on board. Um, and, of course, by doing so, they make them cease to be counter-hegemonies. All right. Now we're at the end. So what is the takeaway in terms of Gramscian's, uh, international, uh, Gramscian's view of international politics? Well, first, social relations are really important. Right? We can't ignore what happens within states. Um, in fact, the fundamental social relations within states are what drives international politics for Gramsci. Um, they are what cause geopolitical shifts, not, not the other way around. Two, ideas matter. Right? Hegemonic worldviews are based around ideas. Um, and all hegemonic worldviews, they are ultimately underwritten by force, but they can't possibly use force all the time to keep that order intact. Uh, if you want to understand then how international politics works, we need to understand the hegemonic discourses that allow states to lead these hegemonic orders, right? Ma uh, rather than merely dominate other states with force. And we should also consider the role that counter-hegemonic discourses play in the world system, so how they absorbed into it, what concessions do they force from this hegemonic world order? Third, international institutions really matter. Right? We need to pay attention to the international institutions that are both a product of uh, and ideologically legitimate the hegemonic world order. Yep. Um, I don't. I don't think there is a most important. Depends what you're trying to do with them, I guess. Yeah. So they all they all play a role, right? Um, you need to understand what the hegemonic ideas are if you want to understand how the world system works. But you also need to understand how they're reproduced and legitimated by the institutions if you want to understand how things work. And you have to understand where they come from to begin with, the social relations. So you kind of you need you need to be looking at all of them, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, so international institutions, um, we need to think about what work they're doing in maintaining this order. Um, and in particular, we should try and understand the way that counter-hegemonies uh, are absorbed into these institutions. Um, but we also need to look at counter-hegemonic institutions, uh, such as the International Labour Organization. How are these institutions able to build up counter-hegemonic historic blocks, or are they able to at all? Um, what alliances are being built around them uh, and being promoted by them? And how are these institutions managing or not managing um, to undermine this hegemonic world order. Finally, we're right at the end now, finally, economics matters. And this is something that we discussed on Tuesday as well. International politics, it's not a story of state relations. International politics is a story about international political economy. It's about the ways in which modes of production, political systems, and ideologies all connect, all interpenetrate. Okay, next week we'll continue with Marxism, but we'll look at Theodore W. Adorno uh, and Jürgen Habermas, both of the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory.